Welcome. My name is Katya Kudryavtseva and I'm Associate Professor of Art History at Stetson University and today I will be leading a gallery talk uh, of Malchishki Baltish, the Soviet Superhero Exhibition. Uh, but before we begin, I would like to thank all the people who contributed to this exhibit and there are a lot of them. First of all, I would like to thank my Russian friends who, even though they hated the book because it reminded them so much of the trauma of the Soviet childhood, they searched tirelessly for every single object that is exhibited here. So thank you guys, спасибо. Secondly, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues from the SPRIS program, which stands for Stetson Program of Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies. And especially, I would like to thank the director of this program who supported me so much throughout this whole process, who edited every single wall text and a wall label in this ex exhibit, and who is just simply an inspiration. Thank you, Dr. Mayhill Fowler. Um, I would also like to thank SPRIS students, and we have magnificent and talented students. So, thank you, Samantha Dunlop, for working on creating a checklist of the exhibition, for measuring all the objects, um, and helping with the installation. And of course, I especially thank two multi-talented SPRIS students, Jonah and Lois, who are standing in front of me, framing this whole extravaganza. Um, and of course, um, last but not least, I would like to thank the director of the Hand Art Center, James Pearson, and Hand, uh, Hand Art Center staff for installing, framing, and dealing with every single tedious aspect of mounting the exhibition. So, okay, we are done with pleasantries. Let's talk about death. Um, the exhibition is devoted to a story that was published in 1933 and was written by Soviet writer Arkady Gaidar. It tells a story about a little boy who was living a peaceful life uh, with his father and his brother. The interesting thing, and it's a side note, the interesting thing about this village that there is not a single female character living there. Soviet world is a masculine world, after all. So, um, Maltish was living this peaceful life, but of course, the bourgeoisie could not stand the fact that Soviet Union existed, where people could live in peace without exploitation and enjoy life. So, in their evil ways, they decided to invade uh, Soviet Union. And uh, while the Red Army was approaching, the father of Malchish went to France, the brother of Malchish went to France, and then there was no one to fight. And so Malchish called on his friends to fight the bourgeoisie until the Red Army could arrive. Um, of course, we know full well that an army of little children standing against an organized um, army of bourgeoisie would have been victorious if it wouldn't be for the treachery of one little boy who just loved jam and cookies too much. And he knew that evil bourgeoisie would, would give him an unlimited supply of those goods. So he betrayed Malchish and his friends. Malchish was captured. He was put in a tall tower, tortured and asked to reveal the military secret. Of course, Malchish would not do that. He just laughed in the face of bourgeoisie and they were puzzled and perplexed why a little boy would not reveal that secret. Malchish was killed, but of course, right before the Red Army came in and defeated the evil bourgeoisie. Malchish was buried and every time the plane would go by, the train would go by, the young pioneers would go by, they would remember uh, what he did, they would remember his sacrifice, and they would say, Salute, Malchish. 
Okay, so now we will talk about the author of Malchishki by Chish, Arkady Gaidar. Um, Arkady Gaidar was born into a family of educators and um, his parents were actually supporters of radical poli politics, so it's not a surprise that Gaidar also subscribed to the um, communist ideals. So after the act of the revolution, Gaidar, who was only 14 years old, uh, decided to fight for the cause of the revolution and he uh, participated in the civil, Russian civil war um, as a unit commander at the age of 14. Any war is traumatic, civil war is especially traumatic because it's, there is no other. You are fighting your own people and my American audience can relate. Um, so Gaidar was not only fighting the regular army, he also participated in the uh, crushing of peasant rebellions. In fact, that was actually downplayed during the Soviet Union. Right? And only after the collapse of the Soviet Union, these documents were published. Now, of course, it became a common place in Slavic studies to quote the Stajewski dictum that no cause is worth it if, if a tear of one innocent uh, child is shed. But you know what? We actually do accept violence for the greater good, right? The question is, what should be the price? So, Gaidar thought that if we're building a world with no exploitation, if we're building a world where people can uh, be equal, where people can would not be discriminated along gender lines, along ethnicity, race, and so forth, with, like how much are you willing to pay for that future bliss? So, um, and if you have a peasant population in Russia who doesn't just get it, right? You deal with that, so he dealt. Um, to use contemporary language, what was happening there would be a stream of um, crimes, right? Military crimes against civilian population, but we will not dwell on it. Gaidar emerges out of that war actually with multiple mental disorders. Uh, in his diaries, he would write that I see the faces of people I killed. So, in a way, uh, his books that he uh, wrote for children as his target audience, it was a way to deal with that trauma, right? Gaidar uh, became a canonical writer, one of the founders of Soviet children literature. And here you can see his busts, and there were multiple busts, um, produced in the Soviet Union and actually like every school would have a bus similar to that there. You have a lot of uh, posters uh, and um, Gaidar also um, not was just writing for the children but he would uh, go to summer camps and he would read his works to the children. Actually, before Malchish, Mal Malchish was published, it was criticized by literary critics, right? Like, why you are creating a cult of dead children? But uh, then he read the story to Soviet young pioneers. They actually loved it, right? Because, you know, then you're young, I guess you are less afraid of death, right? You think that like sacrificing yourself could be this ultimate, beautiful, spectacular death. Only, you know, because as a child, you don't understand that it's like forever. But, you know, again, we will not dwell on it. So, uh, then Nazi Germany invaded Soviet Union. Gaidar actually wanted to go and fight. But he was a valuable asset for the Soviet government. So, uh, several times, Soviet government denied his request to go to France. So, finally, he secured the permission to go to war as a journalist. And as his unit was surrounded, he joined the partisan movement and then um, he was uh, killed in Ukraine. And actually, he died a heroic death because uh, he saw the Germans and he alerted uh, the members of his unit so they could escape and he died. So, our Spring's colleague, Michael Denner, says that people are complex. People are indeed complex. It sounds like a banality, 
but that is very true. Sometimes those layers so are intertwined that it's very, very difficult to make sense of all of that. But Gaidak gave Soviet Union children's literature. Let's talk Gaidak's target audience, the young pioneers. Uh, it was a mass youth organization for children from uh, 9 to 15 years. Basically, of course, it was based on scout movement, but scout movement was bourgeois. Young pioneers would actually have specific ideology, right? To support motherland, to build this new society. And of course, it was very important that after the revolution, you actually invest a lot in educating the children. Because with adults, you know, it's hit or miss, right? Some of them have to be written off entirely. But with children, you can mold them into something. So that organization uh, was doing exactly that, to create loyal young citizens of a new republic. Technically, the membership in the organization was supposed to be on a volunteer basis, but already in the 30s, pretty much every single Soviet child would be a member of this organization. So, uh, growing up in the Soviet Union, I was certainly a young pioneer. So, uh, young pioneers, of course, had very cool stuff, you know, their attributes. So you have a bugle, you have a drum, right? So it starts like the marching, doo -doo -doo -doo, and then uh, you see the banner. Uh, and this particular um, object is very interesting because it says, to the fight for the cause of Lenin, Stalin be prepared. After uh, the cult of Stalin was denounced by Khrushchev, obviously such banners were discarded and so forth, and therefore it's incredibly rare. And I'm very glad that we have that because uh, this banner was created when the book was written, so it's contemporary. Uh, of course, young pioneers would have this red uh, neck scarf, and then the badge, and then the red cap. The red cap would be only worn during communist celebrations. And then uh, both girls and boys, they would be wearing a white top, and then um, either uh, blue trousers or blue skirts. Oh my God, it takes me back to this whole childhood. Okay, so um, there was summons, right? For the cause of, uh, as you can see here in more contemporary world, for the cause of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, be prepared. And then the young pioneers would say, always prepared. And we would do the salute. I was told that I need to distinguish that it was not a Nazi salute, absolutely not. Nazi uh, ideology was based on hate. Soviet ideology was based on unattainable dream. Okay, so uh, I will do that in Russian, so you will get the sense of the language and how it actually played out. So, the борьбе за дело коммунистической партии Советского Союза будь готов, всегда готов. I'm especially proud of this particular display. I called it writing. So what we see here is the ink holder in form of Malchishki Balchish, the little sculpture. We have two ABC books that were published during Stalin era. And here we, of course, uh, one of the books is open and you can see that the children had to learn everything about both Lenin and Stalin. And there is an original notebook uh, from 1930s. So we have a text that was written by a little girl in uh, Stalin's school. So let's read the text and think about it a little bit to actually to see the difference between the Nazi and the Soviet ideology. Okay, so the text. What is Tom dreaming of? The rich are in the palaces, and the blacks are their servants. 
For the blacks, there are only whips and hunger in the shacks. That is why little boy Tom is concerned. Tom wants to go to the USSR because there are no rich there to whip him. And the children are happy there. Tom is black and he will be also happy there, just like all the young pioneers are. The end. Okay, so one of the amazing things about Soviet ideology, again, I mean, none of that was real, but let's talk about how it was on paper, was internationalism, right? So uh, from the very beginning, we were taught that people are born equal, and it was like truly instilled in us, right? That it doesn't matter, your race doesn't matter, your ethnicity doesn't matter, your gender doesn't matter. People are equal and we can achieve everything. That's why a lot of attention was paid to exploitation of the black population um, in the United States and in Europe and so forth. So, uh, and this is, you know, this actually object shows that international spirit of young pioneers. So we talked about the young pioneers, now we will talk about building this utopia of Soviet childhood. And uh, Artek, which was a summer camp, was this space. Uh, in order to get to Artek, the young pioneer had to show either academic merit or bravery because truly, you, you know, you had to earn your place there or your parents could be part of a Soviet uh, nomenclature. I can never pronounce this word. Uh, okay, so let's look at the objects. We have here a cover of USSR in Construction Magazine, which is a very, very special publication because it was created specifically for the Western audiences. It was published in Russian, in English, in German, and later in Spanish. So this is a cover from 1937 and it features the red pioneer um, neck scarf and the badge. Uh, and here we actually see the photographs uh, dated from 1930s to 1950s, also Stalin era of pioneers in Artek. Very often um, in the West, Russia appears to be so gloomy, so stern, so rigid, and so dark. So I included those pictures just to show that, you know what, Soviets were human. And even though those children are living through 1930s and most of their parents of those children would perish in Stalin's gulags, they still would smile, they still would, you know, swim and enjoy their life while thinking about that they are living in the best country ever. And I can relate. When I was a little girl, like before going to sleep and I was, you know, politically crazy, I would say, you know, good night to everyone except for evil American president. Because, you know, it means something that you are living in the country where you know, exploitation doesn't exist where labor is free and so forth. Oh my God, I was so mistaken, but here we go. Okay, so from 1930s, we are moving to 1970s. And despite the whole Cold War affair, still Soviet Union enters a large extended stretch of peace. And therefore, it wasn't uh, so topical for children to strive to actually die for one's motherland. So, so the Union had, like, uh, Soviet officials had to uh, come up with more creative ways to entice Soviet children to the story. And therefore, you see the production of merchandise associated with Malchish. Hence the title, Malchishki Balchish, the Soviet superhero. So what kind of products um, were produced during the 70s and 80s? Uh, there were multiple pins that appeared featuring Malchish 
and of course the candy wrappers and you can see all this you know bright colors featuring malchish but malchish not being tortured but the victorious mal malchish uh, then of course you see uh, different ways to create Malchish costumes, you see the production of Malchish dolls, you see the decorative objects to mix up the decor of a young boy's room, and of course the puppet theater, the china production, and then later we will see the board games. And it especially the production of Malchish merch was important during that time because it had to compete with all the Western goods that started trickling in into the Soviet Union. And the thing is, that was the reason Soviet Union fell. Capitalism rules because it plays to our greed, to our coveting stuff. And here we go, you know, these naive objects could not do the trick. Greedy mouse was much more popular. We are looking at my absolutely favorite object at this exhibit, the New Year tree. And I am not mistaken, not the Christmas bourgeois tree, New Year tree. I hate making general statements, but I don't think that I will be opaced by claiming that every Soviet citizen is maniacal about this holiday, even though like everything in the Soviet Union, it had a tumultuous history. So um, after the revolution, of course, Christmas became super problematic, Jesus and all. Uh, but at the same time, Soviet leaders, they liked the holiday, right? Because again, they were human. Despite all the war crimes, despite all the stuff, they were human and they liked the gifts, they liked the trees, they liked the songs. So it kind of existed in the limbo. It was a private affair, but still it was an official holiday in the Soviet Union. But then the war with religion intensified. So you couldn't really have that holiday uh, as an official non-working day. Therefore, both Christmas and New Year were canceled altogether. But then um, Stalin decided that um, life is becoming merrier right so life is becoming happier therefore we need something we need people to have an outlet that would not be political that would be something about just being merry and being festive so um during stalin new year was resurrected and now all the trappings of christmas right the tree the gifts everything were associated with New Year. So Christmas disappeared altogether and now we have this secular holiday. For the first time, it's not about Lenin, it's not about Stalin, it's not about revolution, it's about magic. Okay, so Soviet obsession with this holiday is unbelievable, right? And um, this tree is kind of crooked, um, because we wanted to get this um, child kind of naive appearance and as you can see uh, the red star topper is also very crooked but it's because this capitalist tree resisted the red star I think there is a conspiracy here but on this tree we actually see some of the um, garlands that are from Stalin's year, from 1930s. And it's actually very interesting because there is like a melange of images. So you see an image of giraffe, you see an image of a bird, you see an image of Santa Claus. Well, Soviet version would be Dead Maros, Grandfather Frost. But then all of a sudden you see kids shooting. You see a child um, operating a tank. You see a child protecting the Soviet borders, right? So still, even though it's about magic, it's not ideological, there was a production of merchandise that would be still connecting the new year with Soviet ideology. And so here we see multiple glass objects featuring hammer and sickle and red star, and of course, an image of Malchish. Even though I was a faithful communist, in my household, we never had any political um, objects.
on my tree. My tree was all about magic. And now we are in the multimedia corner of the exhibit. Again, in order to propagate Malchish with now a more sophisticated target audience, um, we see the appearance of cartoons associated with Malchish and even a feature film. But I guess the most affordable uh, means of actually, you know, bringing this story uh, into the Soviet children home was this contraption you are looking at. It's actually a projector for still films. When I got it, I, um, I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to put it together, but it's like riding the bike. You know, like once you've done it so many times as a child, you kind of do that. So I was so proud of it. And to think of it, actually, my experience with bike was much harder than that. So the parents would be buying to children this still film so they can show themselves, like project them on the walls and actually, you know, follow the story. Also in that exhibit, we actually have a movie reel uh, and the posters for the feature film of Malchish Malchish. Um, remember how I talked about the victory of capitalism and actually there is a delicious um, afterlife to that particular movie. The kid who played uh, Malchish is this, in this movie after the collapse of the Soviet Union moved to the United States, became uh, a mathematics professor and lives the life of capitalism. It gets even, you know, uh, more ironic because the person who oversaw the capitalist reforms, the transition from socialism to capitalism in Russia was the um, grandson of Arkady Gaidar, who wrote the book about Malchish. So, socialism is death. The idea, I hope, is not, because we all deserve a better world. Our gallery talk is coming to a close, and now we are looking at some of the interesting editions of this book. Of course, since it was first published in 1933, uh, the second edition was in 1937, and I'm so proud that we actually have that edition on display here with illustration by Knashevich, the first illustrator of Malchish. Uh, since then, you know, this book would be um, published in millions of copies, and also it was published not just in Russian, but in every single language of uh, every single uh, Soviet Republic and of course in foreign languages. Because this idea of spreading the revolution, spreading the ideology was very important. So on display we have several editions of Malchish's book in uh, English, including this pop-up book, which was you know, produced for the very, very little children, hence very little text, most images, and in French.